Okay. We should have my tag on, but I don't. That's okay. Um, we did a, did a part one a while ago. I'm going to do a little review on uh, the start of here just to, to let folks know what it was if you haven't heard here before. It's a really short review on what it is. Um, so, we'll start with this review. It's the basics. And it's really not very complex here. This is all really simple stuff. So, tones are produced by air vibrating a certain number of times a second. And when we tune our fiddles, it's 440 beat. We tune it at. That's the uh, frequency, the times per second. Vibrations are called sound waves, and sound waves are contained in some way so that the performer can control the loudness, quality, tone, and how long it plays. And some examples of different notes, just how they look when you look at the waves. Because most uh, fiddlers or piano players or whoever don't actually look at this sort of stuff. So this is the sort of the simple technical stuff behind it. Uh, the thing I can put stuff out with is a loudspeaker. I'm showing that because loudspeakers are generally part of an amplifier. You, you hear my voice being amplified right now from an amplifier that's over in the corner. Um, and the loudspeakers are somewhere up in the room here. Uh, and so it's an important part of doing anything on electronic form, whether or not we're uh, taking an acoustic instrument, putting a microphone in front of it, or it's part of the electronic units. Um, I won't review any more on that, just that that's an important element of what we're looking at, just sort of how a uh, microphone works. Just vibrates, essentially. There's amplifiers. This, this was part of the last, I don't want to say much more about them, but there's a couple of different types of amplifiers. Uh, people that play rock and roll still like to have tube amplifiers. Tubes were basically went out of date for most everything somewhere around the early 1960s. Uh, you know, we still had a long time. We had cathode ray tubes for, for until recently for uh, computer screens, but basically the uh, tubes were that way. But rock and rollers like it because they're essentially analog effects as opposed to digital. That, that's important because it's a good mix for a different kind of tone for it. And uh, I, I know last time we were here, we had a, one fabulous guitar player who really showed us how that sounded. Solid state amplifiers are cheaper and more reliable. Um, Sometimes they tip the sounds. That's one of the things that happens about really high notes or the or the the, the way they are set. Sometimes it's, it's actually just chopping off the, the top part of that that's that the wave that we see. Uh, however, uh, is the sounds do sound a little more crisp that way, not as mellow as, as the other. Of course, the sounds are always a lot more mellow than the acoustic instrument, which is kind of fun. We'll have a little that later. So for playing music off of amplifiers and loudspeakers to find in one box, and that's that's the way we talk about it now fair that way. The keyboard, I'm, I'm picking that because I'm going to use that tonight to do a little bit. Um, it, electronic keyboards, a piano style. Uh, I have an old one here that I think it was bought somewhere around 1980. So it's yeah, 1980. Maybe, and that's where we bought it. Um, it's actually a synthesizer. I have two synthesizers sitting here, uh, one on the table and one built into that keyboard. And in fact, I can put a computer here as a synthesizer. Um, in this case, though, a piano on organ can, be, can play different things. This one had about three different things that it could play directly on it. Uh, that's why I brought along this under the synth pleasure, which is a little bit more sophisticated. We'll talk a little more about that later. Massive synthesizer makes it sample sounds. This is the key thing about a synthesizer. It, it actually takes samples from different instruments. They're getting more sophisticated these days, and in a future session, we'll actually uh, I'll actually bring somebody in who knows what they're talking about with, with synthesizers and able to give us an idea of not only how they sample, but what they can do with those samples. It, it's quite amazing. I went to a demo a while back on that. It was a long way, so I'm hoping to get somebody from there. But it, it does, it, it basically creates different sounds working with the waves and the signals and different frequencies. And, and the thing I have on the desk here, this is uh, for our drum set, and it, it actually does uh, some managing of the waves itself. There's some editing when you do this. So that's part of what a synthesizer does. Uh, and we'll talk about that. That's a bit more advanced one. So, um, just pointing out electronic drums, drums are made of things with. We call triggers, uh, velocity, when you see a drum set means how hard it is, so the velocity means also how loud it comes out. The, the kits I had were uh, mesh drums, and just uh, this, I hooked up this thing to it, so this is just a trigger. 
It's meant to go on a, on a uh, I'm still putting on the end here, it's meant to go on a, inside of a, a real drum, just so that it can be electronic. You there we go. Go ahead. Last time, I think I made it sound like a timpani at one point. We can do that again tonight if you want to try it. It's kind of fun. So, uh, in music, basically, the computers started, in, when PC started, the first PCs in the early 80s, and it's come a long, long way since. And the, uh, the point here about the next presentation is this one, Music Notation MIDI, and uh, we kind of finished the last one mentioning that that was in place where it was at. So we're going to go through a few elements here of uh, music notation and, and, and what that different kinds of notation can be and how it sort of fits into this and how MIDI fits into it. Um, I don't remember what MIDI stands for, I think about somewhere. Okay, so first thing to talk about music is the way it's taught. You hear music, you see musicians playing, but you don't actually see music. So the Celtic fiddlers from Cape Breton learned to play that by ear. Most of them typically listen to a small part of the tune repeated until they know the part. And a number of people in this room have done that a few times. Try to try that out, it works. You learn a whole tune eventually. Orchestra musicians, on the other hand, basically all have their own parts. They must read shoot music basically to know what to play when. So it's basically to synchronize. The conductor signals them to help that out, and the tempo and all kinds of things that the conductor's doing. These guys are waving their hands all over the place. But in fact, it's really a control mechanism. It you're not knowledgeable about it, I'm not really very knowledgeable about it, but you know that they're directing things like the volume and sound and who's playing what part and when. So that's, that's, that's kind of neat to understand sort of how it's taught and how it's and how we're dealing with it. So why do we read music visually as opposed to listening to it? So if you learn by ear, you might want to jog your memory and play the right notes. I know that happens to several of us when we are trying to, we, we try that stuff by ear with fiddles and now we have to jog our memory bit. Um, if music is long and complex, reading may be the only way to know how to play it. We have a few tunes that I've been playing that, that take quite a lot of reading because I, I would never remember it all. I don't have that. I got a great forget that you're not that good memory anymore. Uh, as in the symphony, there are many parts that you need to play uh, at the right time, and ready to tell you uh, when to play and synchronizing all the parts. And basically, rhythm music can create the timing of each note so the tune can be repeated uh, uh, the same each time, or at least it's attempted to. We, when we play a rock group, we thought oh, it was doing exactly the same each time. Okay, we can do time trying. Okay. I'm only going to focus on Western music here because if you, if you start looking at music in other parts of the world, you'll notice that the, some of the, some of the uh, notation is different, and in fact, if you look at the scales that are used, there is sometimes different numbers of notes. So from, from uh, if you look at this clearly, uh, these are things I want to talk about a little bit. The first one is simply what, what we learned to sing with in school, do, re, mi, and, and there's a little bit more about do, re, mi in a moment. Uh, notes and staffs, we'll look at what that is, and that's, that's a common thing we see. Another thing that's used throughout the world is called ABC scoring, and we'll see a little bit more what we mean by ABC. Guitar tabs are used, and that's just a mechanism for showing how to, but we'll see that in a moment as well, how to play things on the guitar and what positions are. And drum donation, notation, which initially when you look at it, I think you're seeing some of this, these notes and staffs, but it's not the same thing at all. So, I'm looking at the screen, let me just double check it. Yeah, it's working well. So Western music has 12 notes as its base. And we just look at this scale here, and you'll see that it looks like a piano here. And so you've got 12 notes because you can start here at C and then you repeat here, but you've got the sharps or flats in here and you look at them in the center. So it's, uh, you can explain a little bit more, but these are all semitones that are way through the tones. And that's, that's basically what our, our Western music uses for the most part. So it's kind of nice to see this a little bit because you're already seeing the letters A, B, C that I was talking about before. In this case, they've been numbered on the keys of the piano, a picture of the piano here, including what are flats and what are sharps. So the, the symbols, uh, sharp, which is essentially a pound sign, and a flat, you know, it could be a little B, or it's actually, there's actually a special symbol for it, a lot of music. Um, 
but often we write it that way so it looks the same. And so, for example, here a C sharp is the same as a D flat. And it's basically starting from D if you go down, it flattens it. If you start from C and go up, it sharpens it. It just makes it sound sharper. Um, a good filler knows that you don't want to play sharp notes. If you play a little flat, it's not too bad, but as soon as you can play it sharp, it really sounds bad. If it's longer. I'm, I'm used to that. <laughs> okay, let's have a look at the types, the first three types that are there. <coughs> this little website here shows all kinds of things, including and signs for the notes, which is kind of interesting. But if so, we look at the first top, this is a picture of the scale with notes on it. And they're ascending here, and there's a descending scale here, just showing where they are. If you in school and had to learn all that, I remember, I remember face and every good boy deserves fun. Isn't that it? Fudge, I like fudge. Okay. We had fun. We had fudge. <laughs> um, now, here's Do Re Mi. Now, this is different languages. They say things differently. It's interesting. And I, in fact, if, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but if one wanted to get to the site, I can link to it. It actually will play them and you can hear what it sounds like. It's, it's kind of neat, a little different when they say it in the languages. This is all for singing, right? So if you're uh, doing it in uh, Italian, which is the first up here, for example, the note so, we say so, we get up to the G, and I'll just do this one. Let's see if I can make it work. Let's see if I can the volume here. So. <laughs> he said, I didn't say really. Yeah, so it's so right So So it's interesting, I got hand signals for this sort of stuff. Not quite sure. Um, hand signals are generally for people that are deaf. It, it is kind of interesting to see how this works, right? I'm sure somebody can learn to sing it when they're deaf at some degree. Anyway, that's, that's just looking a little bit about some of the scales in different languages and, and how they use those. Um, I found out that when I was researching some of the stuff that uh, there's sometimes another letter in our scale on which doesn't just go from C through G, A through G, sorry, and sometimes it goes to H, depending on uh, which country, and some of the Germans apparently at one point used the scale out of it. But it's actually all the same notes I found out. So looking at the first part here, scales and staffs. So that the C scale is the common scale, and in fact, it's all the white notes when you look at a piano, pretty straightforward. And, and, and you start at C and end at C, pretty straightforward as looking at it. And you can see here we have uh, two kind two clefs of the notes. Um, and it's really the position of the piano. But if you look back at that, that keyboard I had, it had basically two sets of, of notes going from Probably from C to C. So you had the bass clap, which were lower notes. No, don't play those on the piano. It should work. C. So, so we start at the bottom one, which is just down here. Which is 